Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan. I would like to welcome you to the digital debates on behalf of TRT World Forum. We have been debating the Arab Spring and its impact uh, on its 10th anniversary over the last uh, couple of weeks. This week, we are going to concentrate on what's going on in Tunisia. Um, Tunisia is undergoing a period of uncertainty after President Kaits Said's constitutional coup on July the 25th. Tunisia is a fledgling democracy. Uh, I think it was a source of inspiration uh, for the Arab world uh, and even beyond the Arab world. Uh, uh, there was an attempt to establish democracy and also I think coexistence of Islam and democracy in the country. But at the moment, I think there is an uncertainty in the country. So we are going to uh, have a discussion uh, on this uh, question. I have got two excellent speakers, Ridwan Masmoudi and Nader Hashimi. Let me introduce them to you briefly before we start our discussion. Uh, Ridwan Masmoudi is the founder and president of the Center of the uh, Study of Islam and Democracy. He is based in Washington, D.C. Ridwan is also advisor to Sheikh Rashid Ghanoushi. Uh, he is the uh, leader of the uh, Anahda movement, and he is also the speaker of the parliament. Uh, and he is an active uh, uh, civil society uh, member and also local Muslim organizations in in US. So he is a uh, well known in the uh, civil society environment. In April 2012, he was elected as a member of the steering committee of the World Movement for Democracy. Ridwan, thank you for joining us. Uh, Nader Hashimi is a associate professor uh, of Middle East and Islamic politics and also he is the director of Center for Middle East Studies at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, University of Denver, and he's a very prolific writer on Middle Eastern issues. His publications include Islam, Secularism, and Liberal Democracy Towards a Democratic Theory for Muslim Societies, and also he has written The People Reloaded, The Green Movement and Iran's Struggle for democracy. He has a, uh, other books as well, and he is also a frequent commentator uh, on uh, various uh, forums. Nader, thank you for uh, joining us today at the TRT World Forum Digital Debates. Now, let me start with uh, uh, Masmoudi, Ridwan Masmoudi. On July 25th, Tunisian president has announced that he has frozen the parliament, dismissed the prime minister, and removed the immunity of the members of the parliament by invoking Article 8 of the Constitution. The act was latest episode in a set of crises that the country was grappling with. Can you please explain to us what triggered the series of events that we are currently witnessing in Tunisia? Thank you very much for inviting me. and It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I think that uh, Tunisia has been going through some very tough economic uh, situation uh, and uh, also a political crisis between the various political parties and the institutions of, uh, of the democratic state. Uh, so we've had the crisis now for over a year, maybe a year and a half. Uh, and then on top of that, of course, we have the pandemic. Uh, COVID pandemic, which made it a lot worse and, and has hurt the economy uh, terribly and has hurt people, especially at the uh, lower level of uh, income, uh, uh, are really suffering uh, in Tunisia in the last uh, few months. So uh, President Qais Sayed uh, took this opportunity to basically uh, dissolve the parliament uh, and dissolve the government. Uh, and so now he is... Uh, basically in charge of everything, uh, which is why we call it a coup, because uh, uh, we, uh, we have a, a separation of powers in our democracy and we have uh, checks and balances between the legislative bodies and the uh, executive bodies. And that's how we can call ourselves a democracy uh, for the past 10 years. Uh, yes, yes, we do have economic problems and social problems and health problems. But uh, the solution to these problems is not to go back to dictatorship or uh, is not good to go back to one man rule uh, because uh, that will not solve the problems and it will make it worse. So basically, I think that uh, we need to go back to dialogue and we need to uh, 
the military to go back to their barracks. We are very blessed in Tunisia that the Tunisian military have never been involved in the past in uh, any political uh, conflicts or any political attempt uh, to take uh, over political power. Uh, they have remained, uh, um, you know, um, uh, non-political for the last 60 years. Never, they don't even vote. Actually, Tunisia is one where the, where the officers and the soldiers, uh, members of the military, don't even uh, vote in the elections. Uh, and uh, that's how we they stayed out of politics. Which I think we need to go back to. Um, the military needs to go back to their barracks, and then we have a political conflict uh, that can only be solved by dialogue and by uh, reopening the parliament as soon as possible. And let's all sit down at the table and address these problems, whether they are economic, social, political, or health uh, problems. So uh, I am calling, and uh, now the party is calling, and a lot of democratic parties in Tunisia are calling for reopening the parliament as soon as possible and for dialogue in order to get out of this uh, crisis. Uh, people are angry. It is a legitimate anger. The Tunisian people are not uh, satisfied with uh, uh, the parliament or with the government uh, and what the government has done over the past uh, two years. So we understand that those uh, concerns and that anger is legitimate. But again, the answer is not to destroy our nascent democracy. It is uh, not to go back to dictatorship, which we have tried for 50 or 60 years before the revolution, and we know it does not work, and we know it will not solve the problems of Tunisia. And so uh, we are calling everybody for calm and for going back to the political process and solving our problems uh, through political, uh, uh, peaceful means. Radwan, thank you very much for this, uh, I think, short but very concise uh, introduction to what happened and what's uh, happening. But you called it a coup. Now let me turn to Nadir. Nadir, Radwan has called the intervention of uh, the uh, uh, President Kais uh, Said decision as a coup. But I think there is a... Uh, the public opinion is divided in the world and also in, in, uh, in Tunisia. Uh, given the fact that uh, the Arab Spring has started in Tunisia, and I think it was a source of inspiration for many, many countries, uh, what's your take? Is that uh, a, a coup or what sort of intervention is this? What's your take on this issue? Well, I agree with what Radwan has said. I mean, now Tunisia is facing a series of overlapping crises that are political, that are health, but fundamentally, I think they're economic. Um, it's brought us to this moment of crisis, and it has allowed this authoritarian president by the name of Ais Saeed to uh, invoke a national emergency, of which there is one, to uh, seize and consolidate power. Now, as to whether this is a coup or not, I'm really not sure why there is any debate on this issue. One simply has to uh, go to a computer, Google the words Article 80 Constitution of Tunisia, and you can read what the article says. And what the article says um, with respect to uh, national emergencies and the right of the president to invoke a national emergency um, is in clear contradiction to what Qais Saeed has done. Um, a national emergency can only be invoked according to Article 80 of the Tunisian Constitution after consultation with um, the parliament and with the speaker of the parliament. Um, um, the parliament is supposed to remain in session when there is a national emergency. Um, Gai Saeed has done the exact opposite. So clearly this is a coup. He's appointed himself sort of the judge uh, and the sole juror. Um, and, you know, the big fear here is that he's going to be the executioner if he's not stopped uh, very quickly. So this is clearly a coup. Uh, this is clearly a deep moment of crisis, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm hoping that some of the points that Redwan has made with respect to the participation of other um, uh, civil society groups, political parties, they can rally together to prevent this consolidation of power and stop this coup from going any further and bring about the, the type of national dialogue that is, I think, desperately needed uh, in Tunisia today to navigate this 
very difficult moment. Well, thank you. I think there is an agreement that this intervention is a sort of coup. And sometimes people expect that the military intervention is only uh, described as a coup. I think this is not the case because uh, in Turkey as well, we had postmodern coups, uh, as we can describe here. Not the military, but sometimes uh, judiciary or other uh, elements in society can intervene and stop uh, the development of democracy. I think there is a similarity between Tunisia and uh, the cases that we had uh, in Turkey. Um, and now let me uh, come back to you, uh, Radwan. I think the, the, the whole world uh, has also been divided as far as their attitude towards what's going on in Tunisia. The modern democracies are expected to, I think, um, uh, uh, support democratization process in Tunisia. Uh, that's what we expect. Uh, when you look at the world, how do you see the reactions? Because some countries, uh, I think, do not describe it as a coup. Some countries say, well, there should be restraint. But Turkey, for example, uh, I think right from the beginning, uh, described it as a, called it as a coup. And it was a strong reaction, especially from different political parties and from the Turkish public opinion. But when you look at Saudi Arabia, when you look at uh, Egypt, I think they have had more, let's say, re relations with the with the current president that might legitimize what he has done. What what do you think about the international reactions and how it might impact the developments uh, in Tunisia? Ridwan? Can you hear me? Well, first of all, I also want to clarify this is a coup uh, because the military, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, it's fine now. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. So um, I think that um, uh, this is also a coup because the military also was used uh, in this power grid. The military stayed out and uh, Qais Saeed acted uh, within the civilian uh, political system involving the military, then there could be an argument whether it was coup or not. But once the military get involved and take sides with one side against the other, then of course it be becomes a military coup because by definition you cannot uh, have a political process or dialogue with the military. It's, uh, it's impossible. So that's why I am calling, and uh, all most Tunisians are calling on the military to go back to their barracks and to stay out of politics. We don't want them involved in politics. We do have crisis, we do have economic problems, but the solution is uh, uh, has to be political and not military. Now, uh, the international community, uh, so far, I think we have received a lot of uh, support from uh, many democratic nations including, as you mentioned, uh, Turkey, but also the United States and uh, the European Union. And I think most uh, democratic uh, countries uh, will uh, look at what's happening in Tunisia uh, with great concern and will support uh, the democratic process because it is the, it represents uh, the best hope or uh, so far the only hope that we have in the Arab world. So I am confident that uh, the international community will continue this process and will increasingly do so in the next few weeks. Of course, I'm surprised that the other democratic uh, countries uh, of the world, especially the Arab world, uh, including Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, uh, not only do not support our democracy, but are actually supporting the school and are actually supporting uh, the Saeed's uh, effort to destroy the only nascent democracy in the Arab world. I think it's very unfortunate, but I think it is expected because these, after all, are, are uh, dictators and dictatorships, and they are afraid of democracy. They are afraid that if democracy succeeds in a small country, such as Tunisia, very far away from them, still it represents a threat. So we have seen in the last several months uh, military officers and UAE military presence in Tunisia and I think they are, uh, they have been involved in uh, not only planning this coup, but uh, right now they are involved in carrying out uh, this coup in Tunisia. 
and we call on uh, the international community to uh, put pressure on and the UAE and ask them to leave Tunisia alone with in their domestic policies and they should not interfere in our uh, domestic policies. And we reject uh, the idea that uh, uh, UAE or Egypt or Saudi Arabia have the right to support Qais Saeed uh, uh, financially or politically or any way uh, uh, they he is in an illegal situation and therefore he is not the legal representative of the state right now. But unless he goes back to the constitution, unless he goes back to the institutions of democracy, then uh, they are, have no right to get involved in a domestic political conflict and taking side with one uh, against the other. So uh, we call on the international community, uh, especially the United States and the European Union, but all democratic nations to stand with Tunisia in these times of crisis. Look, I'm not saying democracy is a panacea or is a magic wand and it will uh, solve all of our problems overnight. Of course not. I mean, democracy has its own shortcomings and set of problems, but dictatorship is worse. We know that. We've tried that. We don't want to go back to dictatorship. Let us improve our democracy. Yes, maybe democracy in Tunisia has failed uh, in some respects to deliver uh, economic prosperity or economic growth in the last 10 years. Let's go back to the drawing table and improve the political system. Let's make sure we have strong political parties and a strong government that can implement uh, the will of the majority and can actually implement real reforms on the ground. The problem is in the last 10 years we've had weak governments, weak parliament, weak and divided parliament that hasn't been able to deliver or to implement these reforms. This is the main problem why the Tunisian people are angry and this is the main problem why some of them or it appears almost a majority or half of them are supporting Qais Saeed, not because they like dictatorship or they like what he's doing, but because they are angry with the political system that has not uh, delivered uh, to them, especially lately in the health crisis and in terms of uh, facing the pandemic. So this is actually uh, not a reason to go to dictatorship because I think uh, dictatorship will make things a lot worse. This is a reason to go back to the dialogue and to the uh, drawing table. Let's improve our political system. Let's find out what the shortcomings are, what the weaknesses are of our political system, and let's improve them and let's make sure that we have economic solutions to okay. our plans. Okay, uh, Ridwan, we will, we, will come, we will come we will come to that question. I mean, what should be done is uh, the next question that I'll be covering. But now let's look at the current issues and the main challenges. Of course, uh, I'll ask you what should be done to improve the situation. Now, uh, Nader, uh, I think people... Uh, put a lot of effort uh, for the um, success of the Arab Spring. It has started in Tunisia, but it has spread all over the Middle East. It had positive impacts as well as, I think, uh, unexpected consequences, as we can see, because of the intervention from outside. Now, we are looking at the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring in general, but also Tunisia in particular, because Tunisia is a unique experience when we compare it with Libya, Syria, and uh, Egypt, etc. Um, looking, uh, looking back on the last uh, decade, an argument could be made that Tunisia represented the success story of the Arab Spring. I think there's a consensus on that. With the luxury of hindsight, what is the most important lesson, do you think, of the Arab Spring in both in the short, medium, and in the long uh, term? Well, with respect to the Arab Spring in general, I think one of the lessons looking back over the last 10 years is that despotic regimes in the Arab world will recognize no moral limits when it comes to retaining power and crushing opposition. We saw this clearly in the case of Syria, where Bashar al-Assad presided over a borderline genocide that is ongoing in Idlib province, um, you know, massacring his opposition using chemical weapons, um, supported by Iran and supported by Russia. Um, we saw what General El Sisi did in, um, in Egypt, 
um, in the summer of 2013 uh, in the Rabah al-Adwiya massacre, where he killed over a thousand people um, to retain power backed by the West in the United States. Uh, we saw a similar situation in Bahrain, um, where the U.S.-backed monarchy crushed a peaceful uprising. So I think that's one of the lessons, defeating these despotic regimes uh, backed by external powers is incredibly difficult when they decide to unleash um, massive violence on peaceful protesters. Um, how you get around that problem, um, there are no easy answers. Uh, with respect to Tunisia, though, uh, as you correctly pointed out, notwithstanding the current you know, crisis in Tunisia, Tunisia is an exception, is politically a success story. Um, but I think the lesson from T Tunisia that we should all be uh, listening to, uh, to quote one uh, Tunisian woman, who was quoted recently, uh, she said quite insightfully that you can't eat democracy. And what she meant by that is democracy is a wonderful, you know, political system. Um, but if it doesn't provide uh, the, with the, if it doesn't provide the basic necessities of life, it's very different to value democracy when um, everything else is collapsing around you. So that's one of the insights uh, and lessons. And it's actually nothing unique to the Arab Spring. I mean, I teach political theory. I teach political philosophy. Um, from the dawn of the study of political science, Aristotle in the politics famously you know, noted that the problem with democracy was that democracy represented the rule of the masses of poor people. And he said the problem with that is that masses of poor people were very prone to electing a demagogue who will come in front of them and say, I will solve your social, economic and political problems. Give me the power. And this uh, is something that, that Aristotle warned against. And in, in, in the same conversation, uh, Aristotle said the most stable forms of government are those where the middle class is sizable because the middle class acts as a buffer between polarized segments of society, the very rich and the very poor, thus highlighting the importance of a solid economic foundation. I think all of those insights apply specifically and exactly to the case of Tunisia. Uh, you can't have a successful ongoing democracy unless you have economic prosperity as well. Nadir, I would like to raise the same question with you, the reaction of the international community to what's going on in Tunisia. You know, during the Arab Spring, we have seen that the, the whole world had different ideas about the Arab Spring. Some have, uh, I think, uh, uh, supported, some did not. In the case of Tunisia, there was, you know, this case of coexistence of uh, Islam, democracy, and also secularism. So there was the hope as well. But now it seems that it is being crushed. And uh, the international community do not have a one strong voice, especially the um, democratic world. We have seen this during the um, 15 July um, coup attempt in Turkey, we did not have a sudden strong reaction from the, uh, let's say, the democratic world supporting the constitution, the elected government, elected president, etc. So what is your view from U.S., especially the U.S. position and the, uh, the, uh, the reaction of the democratic world? Well, look, it Radwan's description of this was right. Um, there's been support for democracy in Tunisia, but I think the support has been lukewarm. I would have liked a much stronger set of statements from the Biden administration and from the European Union. Uh, for example, right now, the Biden administration refuses to call what is taking place in Tunisia as a coup. When the White House spokesperson first commented on what was happening in Tunisia, she said that, look, we can't call it a coup. We have to have U.S. State Department lawyers examine what's going on before we can make a determination. I mean, you don't need to be an international legal expert to read the Tunisian Constitution, Article 80, and see that what Dai Said is doing is a clear violation and is... Uh, effectively a political coup. So I think calling a coup, calling what is taking place in Tunisia a coup by the European Union and by the Biden administration would certainly help. Um, uh, sending a clear message to the Tunisian military, which is heavily dependent on the United States, that they will not, the United States will not tolerate uh, uh, military intervention uh, in Tunisian politics. That would help. I think also what would help um, is the point that Radwan raised a moment ago. The intervention of these despotic regimes in the Arab and Islamic world, specifically the Emirates, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, 
and Egypt, intervening in Tunisia's affairs has to stop. And I think the way to stop it is that Joe Biden needs to pick up the phone. He needs to call um, Mohammed bin Salman. He needs to call Mohammed bin Zayed. He needs to call General El Sisi and say in no uncertain terms, back off. Hands off Tunisia, unless you stop intervening, our relationship with you will be put into further jeopardy. And if you're following what's happening in the United States right now, the credibility and the prestige of MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, um, uh, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed of the Emirates and General Assisi is not very good. There's a lot of anger in the American Congress, in the American public over what these regimes are doing in the region, doing to their own society. So I think that would send a message to them. And the other point that I think is, is, is bare mentioning here is that Joe Biden himself has announced that a foundation of his new foreign policy, um, coming off of the traumatic years of Donald Trump in the White House, the foundation of a new foreign policy under Joe Biden and Tony Blinken is support for global democracy, is pushing back against autocracy. Well, Tunisia is a perfect test case for Biden to live up to his stated uh, principles on this question. And I hope he'll do that. Well, thank you very much. And uh, now, Rudwan, um, you know, when we look at the Tunisian case, we see that the uh, Nahda party uh, had many compromises in order to achieve some sort of consensus, some sort of cooperation with different political views. I think that was something uh, very important as far as the legitimacy of the governments uh, are concerned. But there has been also, I think, reaction from within the party that you know there was lack of uh, uh, leadership, there was a crisis of leadership, uh, and there has been uh, recently um, uh, criticism of uh, uh, Sheikh al Ghanoushi. I think most recently, Imad Hammami criticized uh, him. Do you think uh, this will influence uh, the political landscape uh, in uh, Tunisia in general and also within the party in particular? Do you expect that there will be split in the Nahda party? If that is the case, uh, how that will develop? I don't think there will be a splits in the Nahda party. Uh, I think there might be some people who decide to quit or to leave the Nahda party, which uh, is normal and happens all the time. But I think Nahda party has uh, a lot of traditions over the last 40 years uh, on how to handle these disagreements. That strong part of popular party like the Nahda, uh, it's normal to have differences of opinions. Uh, on how to handle this crisis, but not just this crisis, how to handle the political system and how to uh, uh, implement policies and all that. I think that differences of opinions within the political party are not only normal, but they are healthy. They, uh, we need to have those debates in the, in the party. Uh, and then when the party uh, institutions of the party make a decision and they decide we're going to do this or we're going to do that, then, of course, everybody has to fall in line and have to support the decisions, assuming that those decisions are made uh, uh, and reached uh, democratically, which I think so far is what has been happening. So, yes, there is a lot of criticism uh, for the current leadership of the party. There is anger within and about why they didn't see this coup coming and why they didn't prepare for it and why they weren't ready for it. Or about the economic crisis in general, what have you done to help improve the economy? So um, th these, these criticisms are very legitimate. And I think that NADA is preparing its uh, Congress uh, probably in a few months, in three or four months, uh, supposedly uh, scheduled before the end of uh, the year 2021. It was actually uh, scheduled in June 2020, but because of the pandemic, it has been delayed several times because it's a big Congress that a lot of people attend and discuss for three or four days. So we cannot have it right now, but hopefully soon. Uh, and uh, many of these problems have to be discussed and have, have to be uh, corrected. You know, we do need a new number with a vision and ends, both politically and economically. And I think that is doable. We also need a new leadership. Uh, younger uh, people at the leadership with new and fresh ideas who hopefully also are more qualified and more experienced. This is normal and I think it will happen within a matter. Do you think now, that there will be a transition? The political system 
it was designed. Sometimes you will got this connection with Rubit Ridwan. I'll come back to him. Uh, now, let me turn. Okay, maybe what I was going to ask you, whether you expect transition from older generation to younger generation uh, in the Ennahda party, at least uh, in, the, in the medium term, maybe not in the short term. As you have said, younger people and younger generation should take over. Look, of course, of course, there has to be transition. It is, it is part of life that older people uh, retire and younger people take over. That's normal part of life. But I am against uh, any sudden transition. I'm against uh, saying, okay, you know, throw out all the le current leadership and replace them with young uh, 20 years old or 30 years old and who have no experience or very little experience in running the party or uh, even in these uh, conflicts and problems. Younger people need to learn, you know, they need to get experience. The, the, the becoming the leaders in a party takes several steps and takes time and you have to be groomed and you have to learn uh, how to become a leader and what it means to be a leader. So I am, uh, I am skeptical about these calls that, you know, hey, we have to replace everybody and bring all new people, all new generation I'm sorry, but it doesn't work that way. I think that the next Congress uh, at the end of the year will elect new leadership, but, but uh, the new leadership will not be, uh, you know, 30 years old. You know, uh, people who have experience. It needs to be, pe to be people who have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge and expertise in leadership and who have uh, practiced and 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 and, and learn the, the art of negotiation and the art of discussion and all that. So, yes, I am for new blood and new uh, younger leaders. But I think that there has to be a, a carefully planned and carefully executed uh, in order for uh, the, the new Nahda, as we call it, to emerge. But uh, not to lose all of the experience, knowledge, and expertise that. Uh, now the members and now the leaders have accumulated over 30 or 40 years. I want to talk briefly about uh, the fact that it's not just Nahda that is responsible for this crisis. Nahda has only 24% in parliament, less than one fourth of the members of parliament, has uh, no body in the government. The government is all made up of technocrats, independent technocrats who are not Nahda. Mashishi himself, the former prime minister who was just sacked uh, by 25th, is not a member or supporter, has nothing to do with another. So to put all of the blame on this current crisis, whether it's economic or political or health-wise, on the shoulders of another, I think is, is very, very unfair. The political system that we developed since 2011 is weak. It's built on the idea of consensus. That nobody can govern, we all need to govern together, which is about all the You know, at the end of the day, democracy uh, uh, means that the majority has to rule. We can't all agree on uh, on the political system or on the economic system. So okay. We need to re revise the political system to allow okay. a party, whether or not or anybody. This, this, this will be my. And then, we can but, then, and then we can judge. Okay. This will be my last question to you if we have got time, uh, remaining time. But now let me turn to uh, Nadir. Nadir, uh, you know, 10 years ago, the uh, political opposition centered around Islamic movements when the Arab Spring has started. Now, what is the state of political opposition in the Arab world in general after 10 years? And what is the case with the Islamic movements once really led the revolutionary uh, steps uh, uh, sometimes it is argued that they failed delivering what they have promised economically and politically. How do you see it? Well, let's be honest. Uh, there really is no serious political opposition in many Arab countries because most of these countries, um, with the exception of Tunisia, um, are authoritarian regimes that don't tolerate an opposition. Um, uh, there's some exceptions. Okay, Morocco, where political Islamists have had a uh, share in governing, but of course they're not fully autonomous. They work within an authoritarian system and under the close supervision 
of a pro-Western monarchy. Um, but broadly speaking, I want to just invoke something that I wrote recently. I wrote a, um, a long a journal article in the journal Religions called Political Islam, a 40-year retrospective, where I made an argument that, you know, after 40 years of political Islam coming to, you know, uh, global attention and seeking to capture the state, I made an argument if you look at some of the major cases where political Islamists have come to power, um, the, um, the, the, the takeaway um, is not very positive, uh, whether it's Iran, whether it's Sudan, um, you know, Turkey arguably is an exception. But the argument that I make is that the experience with political power, where political Islam Islamists have tasted political power, either comprehensively or in part through a coalition government, um, uh, the general view is that uh, society, uh, uh, the economy, the politics have not improved. Now, I don't think you can blame this all on political Islamists. I think each country has to be analyzed on its own terms. But the argument that I make in my journal article is that the popularity and prestige of political Islam, I think, has reached its peak. I don't see it sort of, you know, surging beyond the popularity that it currently enjoys. And most likely it is on the decline. And now, again, I want to emphasize this can't be laid exclusively at the doorstep of political Islamist actors, the mainstream ones I'm talking about, the ones that believe in politics and elections, etc. I think there are numerous challenges that uh, Arab and Muslim societies are facing today that anyone in power, whether it was a communist, a liberal uh, government would face um, uh, and they wouldn't have easy solutions. I mean, the environmental crisis the pandemic crisis, the unemployment crisis, all of these issues are huge issues that don't have easy solutions. And I don't think any uh, you know, political orientation would, 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 would have an easy time governing, assuming they had the autonomy, the independence to operate and implement policies free of authoritarian control. Okay, then I think you have a, a very uh, pessimistic picture as far as the political opposition is concerned because you said there is almost none. Mm -hmm. Okay, what would be the pol you know potential political opposition? As you can say, I think the Islamic movements they had a peak and now uh, they are in the decline. What would be the alternative if there is any room for uh, political opposition? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, you know, the problem with, you know, political opposition, particularly in the Arab world, is that at the behest of Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is officially banned. There's an attempt to eradicate them. But assuming there was a free space, I, th I suspect that in many ways what we're seeing in Tunisia today, a, um, a, a, a liberal democratic um, uh, Islamist movement. Some people may think that's a contradiction in terms. I don't think so. But a uh, an Islamist movement open to political pluralism, open to human rights, open to critically coalition building with other political parties um, that share a deep commitment to democracy and human rights. I think that's in many ways the, the way forward. This view that somehow if political Islamists can get in power, they will be able to solve all of these problems. I think that's a recipe for state collapse and breakdown and further problems. I think the example that we're seeing in Tunisia today is, of course, um, you know, one that I look to. But now, given the current crisis, we have to sort of be very cognizant of the fact that the problems that our region is facing is not simply a case of, you know, freedom for political parties. Uh, the, re the problems that our region is facing, uh, learning from recent events in Tunisia, is that you have to have an economic foundation to any successful uh, democratic movement, or else the entire system is going to collapse and some authoritarian leader is going to step in and say, give power to me, I will solve your problems. We don't need these discussions, these debates about democracy and human rights. Let's just uh, throw our um, hope around an authoritarian leader who will lead us to a who will lead us to the promised land. That's, I think, the biggest disaster and the biggest concern that we have. Again, taking from lessons that we're seeing in Tunisia today, but also global lessons with respect to the global decline of democracy around the world. Well, important lessons to be taken. Radwan, my last question is to you: is the following? You have uh, already said that the you know one of the sources of the crisis in Tunisia is the current political system which requires consensus to, to govern. And you said that should change. 
Do you think there is a mood for change? There is a demand for change? And if it is going to change, what would be the direction? I think there is uh, no connection. Yes. Uh, yes, he can. Yeah, okay. Yes, I think... I think there is uh, definitely a mood for change in Tunisia uh, within al -Nahba. Uh, If you read the uh, latest uh, communique or statement that was issued by the Shura Council yesterday, uh, there actually is an apology uh, in the statement, a uh, recognition that uh, al -Nahba, uh, has failed to deliver on the expectations of the Tunisian people and therefore an apology to the Tunisian people. So I think the statement reflects that there is a need for reforms both within and within the country as a whole. Now, uh, it's not just Islamic movements or Anahda that has failed. The problem is much bigger than that. All the political parties have failed in the Arab world. Uh, you know, we, uh, I don't mind if Nahda loses the election uh, now or uh, six months or a year from now and be becomes an opposition. If we have another political party or other political parties that can solve the problem, that can uh, govern and can lead Tunisia to a better future, that's fine. That's part of democracy. I don't know if power is part of democracy. We don't have that in power forever. And so uh, if Naba is out of power for four years or five years, it's no big deal. It's not a problem. It might even be good for Naba to be out of power. The problem is how do we protect democracy during those five years? And how do we make sure that uh, we don't go back to dictatorship, that we don't demolish uh, the democracy, that the democratic institutions and traditions that we have built and worked extremely hard for, for the last 10 years to build those, uh, those institutions? Now, uh, we need to reform Nahda. There is no question about it. And uh, Nahda maybe needs a break from being in the government. Uh, in order to develop itself and revise its uh, agenda. And well, thank you very much, Rudwan. Uh, it's interesting, I think, questions as well as observation. Nadir, would you like to have any further comment on the issues that we have covered? If you have, go please go ahead, then I'll close the uh, debate. Well, look, I've long argued that these are the dark days of Muslim history. Everywhere you look around the Arab and Islamic world, um, from um, you know Xinjiang province in China to you know North Africa, there is dictatorship and there's despotism and there's human rights violations. Um, Tunisia was you know the one beacon of hope that many of us had. Now it's going through a deep crisis. I think the challenge for all of us in the Arab Islamic world who care about these issues is to study very closely what's happening in Tunisia, to come to the support of democratic forces in Tunisia. I do want to mention that um, full marks, full marks to Ennahda for standing up, not just for democracy, but for um, liberal democratic values, pluralism, nonviolence, openness. The, the biggest party in Tunisia today that is leading, I think, the defense of democracy is Ennahda. Uh, so it's great to see, you know, um, Radwan acknowledge um, that within Anahda, they are open to introspection, to acknowledging failure, mistakes, the need to have a national dialogue, the need to stand up for basic principles. I think in that sense, if we had more political parties and leaders that were um, as sophisticated um, as Anahda, uh, then I think, you know, the Islamic world would be in a lot better shape. Uh, so I think that's one of the big lessons that I'm learning from these 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 moments of deep crisis and concern. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I would like to thank you on behalf of TRT World Forum Digital Debates, Ridwan Masmoudi, President of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy, and Professor Nader Hashimi, Director, Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. Thank you very much for joining us today to shed light on what's going on in Tunisia. And I would like to say goodbye to all our audience today. Have a nice time. Thank you.